So what masking is, is you're mimicking what neurotypical people do. And it's basically a way to survive. Masking is code switching for people who are neurodivergent. That's what masking is. So you might have your little weird stuff, little weird quirks that you do because you're neurodivergent, like eye contact. So I might be counting how how many seconds you're looking me in the eye. So that lets me know how many seconds to look you in the eye. You might pause, you might laugh, I might pause to let you laugh. Like, and I'm thinking of these things mechanically while I'm trying to seem normal outwardly. That's what masking is. And I know that sounds crazy. That's why I'd be exhausted after the social interactions. Cause my brain has been moving so fast, mm-hmm. trying to keep up being normal yeah. while you're talking. And that does not mean I'm not interested in what you're saying. My brain just wants to be everywhere at once all the time. Um, therapy, I'm not going to lie. I've not been as consistent with therapy, but that's because I don't like everybody. And <laughs> one of the first times I ever said, went to therapy, I was talking about my childhood mm-hmm. and uh, I've seen a lot in Oakland. I've seen a lot more than you should. And I, I remember my, my therapist, my white woman therapist saying, Jesus Christ, to something I was telling her. I was like, oh, I won't be repeating that story again. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so therapy, I don't love doing but it's helped me more as I've gotten older and more comfortable with myself. I think when I was in my my 20s, mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy it because I cared more what other people thought. Mm-hmm. Now I care more about mm-hmm. medication. I don't play about that. I do not play about medication. One people don't understand is that. Hello, everyone. This is Sean Heineman. I am back with another part of our autism series beyond the diagnosis and we have a special guest with us today you are in for a treat i'm excited about this one today's guest is an oakland native whose voice resonates with the vibrate with the vibrant diversity of her hometown we can talk about that too diagnosed with bipolar disorder autism and adhd her journey through neurodivergence has profoundly shaped her worldview and her art her debut debut novel novel the Full Spectrum was born from a desire to see authentic Black neurodivergent representation and literature and mirror her that she's longed for in her journey of self-discovery. Let's show some love to Thressa Pine-Smith. How are you doing this evening, Thressa? I'm so glad to be here, and thank you for saying my name right. I know we <laughs> said that another time, but thank you. That means everything to me. <laughs> No, I, I get it. My name is spelled S H O N, and people will butcher that name. Uh, so, no, I I, uh, I totally understand. Thanks again for taking some time to be a guest today. I am excited as well as those who are watching and listening about your experience. I want to jump into this uh, topic. I wanted to ask you the first question was. Could you share your journey with bipolar disorder and how you came to be diagnosed? Okay, so this is, uh, it's kind of long, but I'll try to truncate it somewhat. Um, So when I was about 28, I went through a really bad breakup with like this, everybody's ex is terrible. This ex was like the worst. So after the breakup, I wasn't reacting to it right. I was doing crazy shit. And I know we should not use the C word when we were talking about Uh, mental illness, but I'm talking about myself. Mm. So I was doing crazy shit. Like I uh, let a stranger tattoo my arm. I still have that tattoo to this day. Um, I was drinking. I was being promiscuous, all these things. And so I went to go get help because I was like, this is not how I typically act. I had a typical nine to five. I'm the middle only girl in my family. Like I I acted a certain way and I stopped acting that way. So I went to a psychiatrist. Um, And they said that I was bipolar. Like that just, that was that. They didn't ask me much about myself and the psychiatrist, um, if I'm being fully honest, was white and older, an older male. So it wasn't a very nuanced discussion. And so since he told me I was bipolar, I was like, fuck it, I'm crazy. That's, I'll be that. That's what I'll be. Um, He also told me I had ADHD. But he told me he could not medicate me for the ADHD because it would make me manic and make the bipolar worse. So I was untreated as far as the ADHD was concerned. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm still continuing the behavior and all that. And uh, like I said, I was about 28. So it's getting to an age where acting like that was less cute. And I, I was becoming more of an adult where you could not have those kind of excuses for what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just went on like that for years. And then when I became about 34, 35, my behavior just calmed down. It just slowed down. Like I still, I had mood swings. So the things that he said made me bipolar were I had mood swings. I uh, had very bad depression, but I didn't have mania like that. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have just huge bursts of energy like that or whatever. Um, and so a, a lot of my poor decision-making just calmed down because it was just the age that you do that, but that's not, that doesn't really coincide with the, uh, with the symptoms of bipolar. You don't just one day decide I'm going to stop doing shit that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I had heard about autism for years at this point, and I always had it in my mind that I might be. Mm -hmm. So I talked to my psychiatrist about it. And he hooked me up with a specialist and the specialist was like, it just sounds like you're misunderstood. So mm -hmm. that conversation just went away. Mm -hmm. So the psychiatrist that I now had, we still, we talked about ADHD though. I was like, I'm not having all these mood problems, but I can't do simple things. So there's something called executive function and executive function is basically uh, task initiation, starting tasks, completing tasks, um, your like, how do I say this? Like your motivation to do just regular things like wash dishes, folk, all those things. Mm -hmm. I was really bad with that. Mm -hmm. I could do stuff that like other people can't do, like write a business plan for fun, like out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. But when it came to like just washing dishes and stuff, I was bad with it or going to appointments that I was supposed to be at, uh, paying bills on time, even if I had the money, just bad at it. Mm -hmm. So I told him, I'm like, I have ADHD and I need to have this treated. And I had almost forgotten that I had it because we didn't talk about it with the previous psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, let's work on this ADHD. So this is what I need you to do. I need you to go on the ADHD website, download the PDF, take the test, all the stuff. I said, if I could do all that, I probably wouldn't have ADHD. And so I kind of cussed him out. Thank God that he knew that it was with love, but I kind of cussed him out. I didn't kind of cuss him out. I really cussed him out mm -hmm. and told him, we need to do this screening over the phone right now. So we did the screening. Mm -hmm. I interrupted him during the screening. One of the questions is, do you interrupt people before, <laughs> <they're>, <laughs> before they finish asking the question? Because you know what they're going to ask. That, I, I interrupted him during that. Um, and so he was like, yeah, you definitely have it. So I got on medication for ADHD. When I tell you life changed, like this, like some of the depression that I had was because I wasn't finishing shit or I couldn't accomplish things that I wanted to in my life mm -hmm. that had to do with ADHD. But I still had mood problems. I still had social problems. Since I was a kid, I always had a problem not having friendships, but maintaining friendships. Like it was out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. If I'm not around you, I'm not thinking about you, which sounds crazy, but it's that's just what it was. Yeah. Or um, I have a problem looking in people's eyes sometimes or like info dumping. Like I could talk about autism and mental health and stuff and you don't have to talk this whole interview and I'll be fine. Like yeah. I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just go on and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and so I still had those kind of things and I felt like weirder in a way, like let's connect it with people when I was taking. So actually I skipped a step mm -hmm. at this point. I'm taking medication for bipolar still. So I'm taking a mood stabilizer mm -hmm. and an antidepressant. And now I'm taking Ritalin for my ADHD. Mm -hmm. I'm taking all these things and I still don't feel right. But it's not that I don't feel right. I just don't feel connected with other people that way. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I think I got the TISM. And he was like, well, we already went through this. I'm like, that lady wasn't listening to me. I know me. I think I have autism. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, okay, I'm gonna put you with another specialist. So the first time when I did 
the talk with the specialist. I was crying and I was like, I just, I don't know who I am. Um, whatever. I wasn't able to accurately advocate for myself why I felt like I was autistic. Mm -hmm. This time I was like, I stem this way. So what people don't know what stemming is, stemming is when you like repeat the same thing over and over. Um, it might be like clapping, hand flapping. I stem with music. I will say the same line to a song over and over and over. I'll play a song for two hours straight, the same song mm. over and over and over. My boyfriend is so sick of Beyonce, so sick of that lady. And he can't say that because that's not, does he can't yeah, say that. He can't say that. <laughs> but he's sick of hearing American Requiem. Mm. And I get it in theory, but I will never be sick of it. Or um, I will eat the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. because texture of it I like certain things I don't like I, I might be the only black person I know who doesn't like pickles I hate pickles bad, is, hate is, so bad. is that the is that the texture with uh with yes the, it's know? slimy yeah. like why do you like that on purpose anyway <laughs> <laughs> well you you talked about the stimming right yeah. I, I want to talk about that real quick because that was something that I had to learn with my five-year-old because he mm -hmm. does that a lot because mm -hmm. he's in our living room he he runs back and forth i mean he would just keep running until he he tired himself out and that was something i had to get acclimated to because i was like why is he doing this but I, again i i didn't know because i'm, he's I'm comfortable yeah he's home when he's doing that <laughs> yeah and i noticed that he doesn't do it anywhere else except for home so mm -hmm. mm. yeah so, yeah that's not a bad thing if i'm doing like i wouldn't like, okay, I go outside and I listen to headphones and um, this is something I've been told about myself a bunch. I will listen to music with my headphones all the way up and ignore the world. And uh, like you introduced, I live in Oakland. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that out here. And I have paid for it. I've gotten robbed before mm. with my headphones on. Yeah. And it was at night and it's like, well, actually I've got I got robbed twice. Actually, I forgot both times with headphones. <laughs> wow! I, my ex-wife lived in Oakland. I we we lived out there for about a, a good month. Oh, you didn't take a month? Yeah. Well, we were relocating. We were moving to Arizona because uh, okay. mom was there, and so we went to help her pack up. So we lived there. Like, was it that bad for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I've, I've got, I didn't get robbed, but I did have the Oakland experience. So I know what you're saying. Yeah. So, but like me living here, I should know better, but I'm so comfortable with my headphones and with the comfort and the pressure and all that stuff that I will basically like forego my safety for my comfort, which mm. is ass backwards. But that, if I would have known I was autistic, I would have made a different choice. Uh, maybe I probably wouldn't even gone outside at the time that I did, but I always have this happened at night both times. Mm. So both times I'm walking out night with my headphones on, but that's the tism. Um, so like I do things like I stem the eye contact thing, like we're on Zoom. I still got to tell myself. And there's nothing else to look at. Yeah. <laughs> but I it's have just, to tell myself you. <laughs> to maintain eye contact. Yeah. Um, I have to tell myself not to interrupt people. And even I'll interrupt people and then be like, oh, yeah, they have to talk like you take turns. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I have to tell myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's better now that I know because I know what behaviors to look out for when I'm interacting with other people. And I know how to take care of myself better because I also suffer from burnout a lot where you have like hyperactivity. Um, you were talking about like your son runs around and stimming, but he probably burns himself out and can't do nothing some days. Yeah. yeah. And that's something that's not talked about a lot is autistic burnout where you just push, 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 push mm -hmm. until you can't do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I know more about that now than I did before because that had always happened to me, but I didn't know why. I would end up going to the hospital sometimes for dehydration. And remember back in the day, we used to hear celebrities going to the hospital for dehydration. It was drugs, but I would actually go to the hospital for that. And it would be like, I would work on a project. I do email marketing. I would work on a project and stuff to, and forget to drink water, forget to eat, forget to just take basic care of myself. Yeah. And all of that is connected to autism. Mm. Are there any misconceptions about bipolar disorder you would like to address? Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't just fly off the handle. 
Yeah. You don't just fly off the hand. Now, if you don't take care of yourself, you're more likely to have uh, mood swings that would make something like that happen. But it's not, bipolar is not two personalities. It's not, um, that's that's a whole nother disorder. A bipolar is a mood disorder. So bipolar is manic highs where you have a lot of energy. Um, I think of somebody like, I hate that is this person, but think of Kanye West. Manic yeah. highs, no sleeping, creativity you think you can do anything mm -hmm. if I wasn't bipolar I probably wouldn't have wrote my book I'm not even joking because when I have energy I can do anything for a long time and I talk myself and be like I'm just gonna be the greatest whatever in the world mm -hmm. and then you have low lows so the depression is like fetal position no don't shower don't brush your teeth everything's the saddest thing in the world um suicidal ideation but it's not two personalities mm. it's not I don't know who this person is and it's not like that it's just um it's just a contrast of the same personality it's a mood disorder it's not a personality disorder and that's a it's a big difference in those things mm. so somebody who is bipolar like myself I had to take a mood stabilizer so that though the pendulum the pendulum doesn't swing so hard yeah um, you also have to take care of yourself so sleep People don't realize that sleep hygiene is a very big thing. You your body recovers when you're asleep. Somebody who's bipolar, mm -hmm. they cannot, you you need to be on a sleep schedule. That probably is the best thing I've ever done for myself is being on a sleep schedule. Um, and the way you eat matters a lot because sugar, crashing, all these things mm -hmm. have to they affect your mood more than you think they do. Mm, wow yeah but it's just the fact that it's not I just wish people didn't use the term like that that person's bipolar and they're talking about two different personalities because it's not that at all mm -hmm. I'm glad that you debunk that because it, you hear that a lot in, in social settings and stuff so I'm glad. thank you for asking me that nobody's ever asked me that yeah, I, I think it's important because we use words like bipolar, we use words like autism and ADHD, but a lot of people are still ignorant. And I'm saying it in a in a in a good sense. A lot of people just don't understand. They just throw these words around, and and they just start to label people and have no idea what's going on. Right. Hence why I'm That's doing me. this this series. So I'm glad you. Uh, took the time to debunk that. Uh, what role has therapy and medication played in your mental health journey? Man, okay, so I know we could be in our community very like against both of those things. Um, therapy, I'm not gonna lie, I've not been as consistent with therapy, but that's because I don't like everybody. And <laughs> one of the first times I ever said went to therapy, I was talking about my childhood, mm -hmm. and uh, I've seen a lot in Oakland, I've seen a lot more than you should. And I, I remember my, my therapist, my white woman therapist saying, Jesus Christ, to something I was telling her. I was like, oh, I won't be repeating that story again. Mm -hmm. um, so therapy, I don't love doing, but it's helped me more as I've gotten older, more comfortable with myself. I think when I was in my my 20s, mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy it because I cared more what other people thought. Mm -hmm. Now I care more about mm -hmm. medication. I don't play about that. I do not play about medication. One, people don't understand is that just like everything else, you withdraw from medication. But the withdrawal from medication, if you don't take it, is your emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. So if I don't take my medication, I can't function pretty much. I'm depressed. I um, So another thing that is a symptom of, of bipolar is poor judgment. So you'll see somebody who's bipolar making poor life decisions. If I don't take my drugs, I will make some stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. So I make sure I, I will literally wake up at five o'clock in the morning, take my medication and go back to sleep. So when I wake up, I'm like saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how so, long? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, so I'm very much a proponent of medication. If you don't believe in medication, supplements, food, whatever you put in your body affects you. Mm -hmm. So same thing. But you can, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So how long did it take for you when you started taking medications to know, like, 
this working for me? Like you said, you you would take your medication and go to sleep. Like, was that a long process and trying to figure out like? That is a good question. Let me tell you something. Mm. I took Lexapro at first. And I'm not saying uh, don't take Lexapro. I'm mm. saying find out what works for you because it did not work for me. Lexapro made me so depressed. One time I, my mama had to come over and um, before I had my hair locked up, brush my hair for me to go to work. I could not even move. I was like so zombied out. It took mm. my whole, my whole like personality away. Then mm. I got on Paxil. Paxil was hilarious. I'm still on it. Mm. Uh, it's an antidepressant. Paxil was hilarious because when I first got on it, I was like, I want to wash the dishes. I want to do this. And I'll be like super happy about it. And my mom told my brother, she was like, I think she's going to kill us because she was, <laughs> because I was just so happy about everything. And eventually, like when you get on that good medication that works for you, you smooth out. There's like at first there's like a peak of like it's uh, efficacy where it works really, really well. And it's like overworking. And then after that, it like smooths out. Your body gets used to it. So I'm not... I want to wash the dishes. I want to do laundry, mm -hmm. like super excited about doing chores, but I can get them done, which before I barely could. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer your question, it took, it took like six months before we could find oh. a good, that was just the mood stabilizer and the antidepressant. Remember the ADHD medication came later. Mm -hmm. So both say, six months for that and then for when did I start taking probably like three more years when I got on ADHD medication mm -hmm. so and then there was a shortage so I used to be on Adderall mm -hmm. but there kept being a shortage so imagine you could do everything in the world and then the pharmacist is like we don't have it and then you can't do nothing oh wow so what happened, to me what happened? So that it, there's a shortage because um, there's only one supplier mm. of Adderall. And I don't know, I don't know what happened during the pandemic, but we all figured out something was wrong with us in the way. Mm. But every, everybody <laughs> got diagnosed with something. <laughs> everybody got diagnosed with something during the pandemic. Like that's, that's when I figured out that I had more than just bipolar it was during the pandemic. Um, but there was a shortage. And so, and there still are shortages sometimes of Adderall, but I'm on Ritalin now because I cannot keep going back and forth like that. Mm. Um, so it would be like, I got on Adderall, clean up my house, deep clean my house, uh, <laughs> do a whole <laughs> bunch of freelancing projects, all this stuff. And then they'd be like, it's a shortage. And they'd be gone for like two, three weeks. Mm. And I'm just down in Red Bulls and trying to get as much caffeine in me as possible, like an unhealthy amount until then. But it's, I'm crashing every day, every day, every day. And it's just dark and I can't do as much. And then it would, then it would be available again. Mm. And I told my doctor, like, we got to figure something out. So yeah. we switched to Ritalin, which is not as effective, but it's more, um, I'll say smoother. Like it's a delayed release. Mm -hmm. So it's not... I'm not just super hyper in the beginning of the day and then crashing. Yeah. Wow. Well, we have some people that's live. Uh, one person said, uh, Mad Max says, uh, this will help me uh, understanding and understanding people who I currently know is on medication. Thank you for sharing uh, a bit of your story. Um, if you have any questions for a threat of, Please, please feel free uh, to comment while we have her because she's given so much great information. So I want to make sure that you learn as much as you can from uh, this interview. How do you experience social interactions and have you developed unique coping mechanisms for social challenges? OK, so this is an interesting question because um, my family and friends will tell me that everybody likes me and people don't realize that when I get home. I have to decompress so much from social interaction. I'm so exhausted mm -hmm. when I interact. So when I'm having a social interaction, like I said, I have to remember to look at people in their eyes. I have mm -hmm. to remember to um to not cut you off. I have to remember to listen to what you're talking about because <laughs> ADHD, you'll say something, um, you'll say, the weather outside is sunny and they'll be like, sunny. Oh, I, then I'll be like, 
Oh, Stevie Wonder has a song saying, Sonny, did you see on Facebook how they said he died the other day? You know how I was about to cry? Like, I'll, it'll just go like, Yeah, the rabbit everywhere. trails. Yes, except for what the, the and then I have to remind, come back to the conversation. Like, <laughs> so my social interactions, I can socialize. Yes. Am I good at it? Yes, but there's also a thing called masking that neurodivergent people do. So what masking is, is you're mimicking what neurotypical people do. And it's basically a way to survive. Masking is code switching for people who are neurodivergent. That's what masking is. So okay. you might have your little weird stuff, little weird quirks that you do because you're neurodivergent, like eye contact. So I might be counting how many, how many seconds you're looking me in the eye. So that lets me know how many seconds to look you in the eye. You might pause. You might laugh. I might pause to let you laugh. Yeah. Like, And I'm thinking of these things mechanically yeah. while I'm trying to seem normal outwardly. That's what masking is. And I know that sounds crazy. That's why I'd be exhausted after the social interactions. Because my brain has been moving so fast mm -hmm. trying to keep up being normal yeah. while you're talking. And that does not mean I'm not interested in what you're saying. My brain just wants to be everywhere at once all the time. Yeah. So socially interacting is like, sometimes I hate it because I'm like, this is going to take so much energy, even if it's something I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like um, the, um, I live downtown Oakland. So like all the parades and stuff happen over here. Mm -hmm. So the pride parade was over here the other day. The brat was down the street. Mm -hmm. So me and my boyfriend went for like an hour. And that was cool. And then, I, then we had a drink. I was so happy because I was like, yes, you're going to get sleepy. Let's go home. <laughs> was I having fun? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't care. I'd rather be in my house. I always rather be at my house. Then you could say that Beyonce is down the street giving away money. I'm going to go for five seconds. Say, hi, Beyonce. Get my money snatch. Go home and take a nap. Because that five seconds took so much energy. To get out the bed, mm. <laughs> ready to go see Beyonce. Actually, I'll go for 10 seconds for Beyonce. <laughs> so, yeah, I can socially interact. Um, I think being on our community, we don't have a choice. Like, we we are just now having the neurodivergent conversations. Like, uh, white boys have been beginning to be autistic their whole lives. We haven't had that. And then I was raised in church. So mm -hmm. there's also the thing of knowing how to speak, having manners, all these things that are instilled in you that is not like you don't yeah, you don't not speak to people. You don't not look them in the eyes. You don't not say you serve ma'am, all those things. So even when I knew when I was younger that I was different, mm -hmm. I still had to perform social interactions the way that I was told I had to. Yeah, it just was. I just needed a nap after. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's interesting. Because you talk about the eye contact. And I was asking one of my guests last week, mm -hmm. um, do you think the eye contact have anything? And this is just me speculating. This is And ask whatever you want. It's not gonna hurt my feelings because I didn't heard everything. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I appreciate that. But I was wondering if that had to do anything with like our phone usage. Do I think it makes it worse? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You cause... know, because you know what's made my ADHD worse, but not worse, but this app is made for me. And I don't think that it's helping neurotypical people. TikTok. TikTok is made for me because with ADHD, you just want somebody to hurry up, tell you all the information, and go on. Mm. So that's that's just that all day, all day, all day, all day. I yeah. learned so much stuff on TikTok. Do I think it's helping neurotypical people? No, I think it's ruining y'all brains. But for me, it's fantastic. In fact, I've learned so much stuff about autism where I was like, I do that, I do that, I do that too. But um, the phones, I doubt that they help. And then honestly seeing, I see neurotypical children, like I've done caregiving before and I see them with these games and stuff. I'm like, this is ruining y'all. Like, this is ruining skills that you actually have. And then I um, used to do caregiving for an autistic child who he actually helped me figure out that I had autism. Two really? Ways. Yes. One, because we would just be talking the same way. He didn't 
like he wasn't nonverbal, he was verbal, mm -hmm. but we would just have the same language. But he could also teach me anything. I do not care about video games at all. Yeah. Tell me how that little boy had me playing Madden, <laughs> had me had my team in the playoffs. I told him, I was like, we're about to go to the Super Bowl. He taught me the day he taught me, I'm like, watch my team go to the Super Bowl because mm -hmm. I don't want to say that people who with autism can learn anything, but we can learn a lot real fast. Yeah. If, if we're interested. Yeah. So I told him we're going to the Super Bowl. He's like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about, sir. Uh, <laughs> and we went to the Super Bowl. But it was the fact that we just used to have this connection where we had our own little language. Yeah. And like we could just be in a room, not talk, chill. And it wasn't weird. It was just mm -hmm. just how we connected. And like watching him, I I wish, I mean, not that doing child care for him was the easiest child care I ever did because when people with autism are hyper-focused that's just what we're on so if you gave him a puzzle a game whatever yeah. long as you fed him he ain't need you <laughs> <So>. <laughs> wow this is so good if you have any questions for our guests please feel free to ask thank you for everyone who is joining this is really good it's helping me so thank yeah. you for schooling me on some stuff. Uh, how do you advocate for yourself in medical settings when managing multiple diagnoses? Okay, so for me, I think the most important part, um, I know as I've told the stories, of, I've been mentioning the races of my mm -hmm. medical practitioners. And the reason I've been doing that is because a lot of our symptoms look different when it comes to us. Like our depression can look like anger. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to be depressed. We can't not work. We can't, we can't go on sabbaticals for a long time. So our depression can look like anger. Um, stemming, my stemming is musical or it's twisting my hair or it's rocking, I do a lot of rocking. Um, <laughs> and so I would have to educate myself fully on the differences um, on how my autism and my ADHD and my bipolar looks and be really educated about the differences and also know that a lot of medical pr practitioners don't have a lot of familiarity with what it looks like in Black people. So it's like you have to, the twice as much is for everything. It's including our mental health. You need to educate yourself. If you think you have some kind of issue or your children have some kind of issue, you got to do as much, you got to do an education of a doctor, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> you got to yeah. do their job and tell them, I think they have this because of this. Because you might end up with a child who has who is going to school getting told they have oppositional defiance disorder, which is basically you can't listen in medical, mm -hmm. but they just might be autistic and you don't know how to communicate with them, or they might have ADHD, and you're talking about your child can't sit still, and they're like nothing's wrong with them. They sound like they're six. Mm -hmm. No, they actually have ADHD and they have to learn differently and they need different tools. And that doesn't mean anything's wrong with your kid. There's people with ADHD who are, you know, high performing, mm -hmm. like um, small bowels got ADHD and because I've been looking up all the black people. <laughs> <laughs> small bowels got ADHD, Salon Snow's got ADHD. Um, what's the dude from um, The Daily Show? Noah? Oh, Trevor uh Trevor, Trevor Noah got Noah. ADHD yeah. and depression. Um, like it's it's not that you can't be functional, but you have to be functional differently. It's no different than if you're diabetic and you have to go on a different diet. Yeah. It's no different than if you um have some uh it's something with your Achilles or your knees and you need a cane. You mm -hmm. just need different intervention. And so ignoring that, people think that if you acknowledge that you have these issues, that you're giving yourself a crutch. No, you're helping yourself get through life. And especially like if you look at your child and you know it's something going on and you don't do nothing about it, you're not helping them get through life easier. Mm -hmm. And I know we're Black, we're going to go through it anyway. So why would you want their life to be harder? Yeah, I totally agree. Because my wife, she she picked it up quick. I mean, you know, this is, this is what she do. Mm -hmm. And... I, you know, I'm, I didn't know. I'm, I'm oblivious to it. I had no idea because um, mm -hmm. my four year old, he's just starting to talk, mm -hmm. you know, because he's he's been nonverbal for a while. Uh, my five year old, he's 
he know his states, he know the countries, he know everything, right? He probably loves that stuff. He, he probably thinks that's the most it. interesting thing. And you just like, okay. Yeah, yeah. I went and bought him a, a atlas book, like with all the states and and all the you know <laughs> mm -hmm. details of each state. And he can, t you know, he told me the other day he wanted to move to uh, Brazil. <laughs> yeah, That's so cool. <laughs> I said, okay, well, make some Brazil money. We'll see what happened. Oh wait, I was never. I forgot. My mama forgot to tell me a bunch of stuff. Now that I'm older, mm -hmm. you know, in hindsight, she could be like. Oh, that was definitely the tism. Mm -hmm. I was nonverbal till I was two. And it was, but also because I had ADHD, the doctor was like, oh, her brain just is trying to catch up. I just used to like mumble a lot and just point. Mm -hmm. So just like, it, that doesn't mean they'll always be nonverbal either. Like, I just didn't know how to, and I still have issues sometimes. If I get like exhausted, I'm not talking. Yeah. Yeah. So I could go nonverbal now. I might I might not talk to my boyfriend for like three hours after this. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> and that's just this what it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so if you have a child who's nonverbal, that doesn't mean that they will always be nonverbal. It just but and that also doesn't mean that they can't communicate. That they you just might have to find a different way for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, because my four year old, he's coming along, you know, he's starting yeah. to say more of like the little kid songs and stuff like that so we're i was gonna say does he like music yeah he yeah, yeah. so we work. that's gonna be the way that's gonna be the way i yeah. am whatever's clever we <laughs> we're gonna <laughs> run with it uh have you found any supportive communities or resources that have been helpful for you yes okay so i'm chronically online i'm chronically online so during the pandemic i was on twitter like too much way too much uh <laughs> and now I I'm not on Twitter as much because ever since Iran oh, yeah. have bought it, there's not it's not safe. It's not safe. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like the environment. It's very we don't have to talk about that. But <laughs> I'm on Facebook more because there are neurodivergent groups for black people on there. I'm also on a Discord that's neurodivergent, which I actually it was crazy that I wrote about a Discord for neurodivergent black people in my book. And then Jordan went after my book was published. But I'm in a neurodivergent Discord for black women. I'm in uh unicorns, uh black unicorns who are neurodivergent um Facebook group. I'm in a bunch of like Facebook and then threads is like way more positive. I love threads. They Listen, Threads is like what Twitter used to remind me of before it got crazy, but even more positive than that, it's like, I don't see, it's not no mess on there. It's everybody supporting each other and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, get on Threads, but don't get on Threads starting mess. If you're going to get on Threads, don't don't start mess. If you're going to start mess, don't get on Threads. All right, don't mess <laughs> up the community. Don't mess up the community. Please don't mess with me <laughs> because I like my whole attitude is different on threads. I get on threads and be like, what am I going to learn today? What supportive, <laughs> what supportive motivational quote am I going to see? Like, it's not, it's a whole different environment. And then I love TikTok. TikTok's not really a community, but I learn a lot about um, just what autism looks like because it's my, like my, more of my hyper focus. Like I understand bipolar so much. ADHD, I understand so much, but autism is like this this Rubik's cube where I'm still trying to understand where it fits into my life because yeah. I want to shed a light on it. And I feel like there's a lot more Black neurodivergent people than we think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I liken it to, do you watch X-Men? Oh yeah, I love X-Men. We went to go see uh, Deadpool and, and Wolverine. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I, first of all, lo I love X-Men. I think about Black neurodivergent people like X-Men. So it's X-Men who can hide their powers and it's X-Men who they just, they out there. And I think it's more neurodivergent Black people than we think there are. Yeah. Like a lot more. And I feel like I notice them more because I understand the symptoms. So I'm, I'm like really obsessed with learning as much as I can about autism and what it looks like in us more than anybody else, what it looks like in Black people and then in Black women. And then I I am noticing, I talked to somebody else about this um, on TikTok. There's not like a lot of Black male representation as yeah. far as, like, you think of, you can't think of like an adult Black man. Like, I'm starting to see, slowly mm -hmm. but surely, social media, but like, 
we don't have like a character. We don't have a who's the person. We don't have like an arch archetype of a black male, high functioning, especially because of the fact that we have to move in the world. We don't get to black people. We don't get excuses just because we might have a mood disorder or a mental disability or whatever. We don't get them. Um, we just have to survive. Yeah. So I just would like to see a lot more of that representation because we just don't have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. forgot what the question was, my bad. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm I'm and again, this is why I'm doing this series. Um, because there are so the response was great. And I was just thinking like we have to uh jump on this and and bring more awareness and, and more acceptance, all that all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and I believe that you know, God brought my boys to me, you know, with you know, having autism is like helping me to learn. Um, and to think outside of myself, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lady that asked on Instagram, she wants to know the name of your book, The Full Spectrum. Uh, so since she asked about it, I put it in there, but I'm going to have it in the description as well so people can purchase. So can you tell us uh, about your book, The Full Spectrum? Because Yes, we I would love to do that. Yes. So um, I wrote and self-published my book, The Full Spectrum, and I basically wanted to write about Black neurodivergent adults because, like we said, we don't see that representation anywhere. Um, so it's basically about a group of Black neurodivergent adults in the Bay Area who are online and they're meeting each other for the first time, but they're also like meeting themselves because they're having conversations they never had. They're having relationships that they've never had before. And it's just like, what does it look like to be neurodivergent every day? But it's also like a feel good. You know what's crazy? Mm. One of my favorite movies is Forrest Gump. Oh, yeah. Because Forrest Gump just be moving through life <laughs> being special, right? Yeah. And I'm not saying that neurodivergent, I don't know what Forrest Gump's specialness was. <laughs> we won't. But I always felt like, that movie was like a feel good movie, even though it shouldn't have been. <laughs> and so that's kind of what I wanted to feel like. Like these real life things are happening to these people. Yeah. Uh, and sorry, this is my my proof copy. You see, it says it can. Oh be. yeah. Oh for sure. Um. Yes. But they're they're going through like real things. They're going through relationships. There's a there is a father who has twins with autism. There is a a non binary. A character there are there's a character who's a writer but there's these people going through these very real oakland things like in their car bipped bipped is oakland slang for your car getting broken into <laughs> <laughs> going through these very oakland things but going through them while also being neurodivergent and i just wanted to write about that because i don't see that representation anywhere now are there some characters on tv that i think are neurodivergent sinclair from from um living single oh, yeah i think lynn from girlfriends was probably had adhd because she couldn't focus on nothing like but wow. we don't have people who are like this person is that and this is what it looks like and you should try to understand it because you probably got somebody in your family who is going through this and has nobody to talk to or doesn't even know what it is but they know they're different mm -hmm. like your 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 kids are very blessed to have you because you're it's not that you're just like, oh, you have this, but the fact that you want to, you know, have your variations and your knowledge to understand it for them, yeah. that is so beautiful. And but it's also rare. Yeah. That's not happening. Yeah. People would rather pretend their kids don't have these issues going on mm -hmm. and just be like floating through life. Um, yeah. and so I just wanted to write the book to acknowledge this this situation but also I just enjoy writing it because I, there were some situations that I got to write about I got to write about like being at the black joy parade and it being sensory overload and then you run into one of your exes and you be like oh I gotta go um <laughs> first it's too loud and then I didn't mean to see you bye because Oakland is a small town that masquerades as a big city everybody kind of knows each other it's too much yeah. um, <laughs> that's another thing about oh that's another autistic thing. I hate going outside because I know I'm going to run into somebody I know and I got to pretend to be social. Mm. And I don't want it. <laughs> like, yeah. like I live by Lake Merritt. I don't know if you're, you're familiar with Lake Merritt. 
I heard of it. Yeah, I heard Okay, of it. so Lake Mary is this big lake that people walk around. It's about three miles Mm -hmm. and you jog and fitness and all that. And it's right by downtown. So it's like a hub and you like you just run into people all the time. Yeah. And you would think that's somewhere I would want to be all the time. That's a great place to live by Lake Merritt. I never go to Lake Merritt because I'm going to run into somebody I know. <laughs> and so those are the type of situations that I write about in the full spectrum. Um, and I just wanted to write a book and I just did it. And that's that that's that autism stuff. Yeah. Just, oh, I just feel like writing a book today. Okay. So, yeah. So okay. please support <laughs> Oh, no, for sure. I want to make sure. Yeah, everyone, because there was a lady that asked. Um, so I will have that in the description below. Make Thank sure that you. you support the book. Sounds great because, uh, of course, I want to support your work uh, as well. Uh, how does before we end, because time has gotten away from me. Uh, okay. <laughs> how how does that work in the sense of relationships when it comes to uh, you talked about your boyfriend? So how did y'all meet and how did y'all have that conversation? Like, give us So a- this is the plot twist. My boyfriend is neurodivergent too. He has ADHD. Uh-huh. So we met at Starbucks, but we realized real quick that it was, we was both off and it worked, <laughs> it worked out. But in my other relationships, it did not, I, we, I didn't know I was neurodivergent. I didn't know I had autism specifically. Yeah. So it was things where I would like, I would pick the wrong men, but I also would be, men would, I would be in relationships where we would really be in love, but I also didn't care at the same time. Like, it would be like a disconnect Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with their feelings for me. I have made, how do I say this legally? (laughs) I have made very hard men. I've reduced them to tears because I just didn't care about something. And I mean, like, very East Oakland men. Mm-hmm. Um, thank God my boyfriend is here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have made I I have like ignored the feelings of people where I didn't mean to do that. I just because I'll be so literal. Yeah. I'll be so I'll lack so much nuance that I won't pick up on like something that's supposed to be an indication of love or indication of their feelings for me. And you have to break stuff down to me like I'm five sometimes. And fortunately I have a partner who's patient about that. Do we get on each other's nerves? Yes, but there's things that we understand about each other that other people will never understand. The late bill payment. You might cut somebody out for forgetting to pay rent that you know you have. Mm. We just, we just gotta eat that late fee. Like, because we have to understand because next month it could be the other person doing that. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a level of understanding that we have. Now, I get on his nerves with the literal stuff too, but he knows that he has to break the stuff down to, for me to get it. Yeah. And that I'm not just being obtuse on purpose. Mm-hmm. So sometimes he forgets, but <laughs> I think it's, this is probably the more, um, the most communicative I've been in a relationship yeah. because I could tell, I could explain my feelings. I didn't even know how to explain my own feelings before because of that. My mom and my family, they, when I said, when I said I was bipolar, didn't nobody believe me. When I said I had autism, they was like, yes, girl. Yes, you do. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so my family, <laughs> they're just learning, they're just learning with me, but yeah. they're very, supportive yeah. and they just agree <laughs> they're just like <laughs> so they now they don't like any arguments with me because I'm so literal because I didn't did whatever research because if I'm arguing with you I'm right I <laughs> I figured out I did all the research I'm literal I mean it and I you can't convince me otherwise of whatever I'm talking about yeah <laughs> and that's annoying for my man but mm-hmm. Google it. Whatever we arguing about, Google it because I'm right. So, <laughs> oh my God, no, that's good because ultimately this this channel is you know relationship based. This this series though, uh, mm-hmm. I really wanted to go somewhere with it. So, um, you can even kind of uh, kind of mix the two together a little bit. I was looking at some research on psychology today the other day. And they mm-hmm. said that, that website. Yeah, yeah. I'm a psychology today nut. Uh, mm-hmm. 80% of marriages end of uh 
married couples who have kids with autism? Well, I think it's usually, no, I can't say usually, but I think if somebody doesn't accept that it's happening in the first place, that like if you don't fully accept your children, then that's going to be a problem. Um, I don't see that with you. So it's just like that what you're doing is so important for your kids. I know it's important for you, but it's so important for your kids because they're going to feel that love. They're not going to feel that lack of acceptance and they're not going to feel other they're going to feel othered outside eventually Yeah. anyway so they don't need that from you so I don't think that's a I think you're going to be in that 20 percent there you might have challenges everybody has challenges because relationships are challenging but I don't I think you're going to be just fine just based on what you're willing to do to learn Yeah. 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 There was a book. Um, there's a book I'm reading on autism. And it's kind of like uh it's almost like a kid's book, but it's for adults. So What is this called? I need to read this. Yeah, I it's called uh I'll I'll have it linked up as well. Um Okay. but I'm learning and it's like it's it's like cartoons. So <clears throat> so I'm reading this book and they're breaking everything down in the simplest form. And I'm like, oh okay. Like my son, he doesn't like me washing his hair. You know, he don't he But don't like sensory, it. that's why my hair is locked up because I'm not tender headed. I hate it. It's more than tender headed. It's worse than tender headed. Yeah. I can't, I can't do it. And I never was interested in hair. And that was, that's another thing. Like if you got a kid who just hates getting their hair done, it, it might be a symptom. Yeah, yeah. But I had to learn that. You know, I'm just thinking and wash his hair, but he's like, I want to wash my own hair. I don't like me washing my hair. I'm like, okay, well, this is okay. I'm learning. And I read that in the book about those that those sensory um issues. I was like, I'm okay. so proud of you. Look at you. I'm sorry. You really educate yourself. <laughs> that I'm, makes me so happy. I'm I'm learning. I mean, it's it's you know, uh, yeah. But that's another conversation for another time. We can Yeah, stay yeah, yeah. for another hour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the thread of this conversation has been phenomenal. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your transparency. Um, just this, I love this interview. This was great. Can you let everyone know how they can get in touch with you? And also, what else do you have coming up? So I'll have everything linked in the description. Okay, so you can get in touch with me on threads at Finally Feeling Seen, um, because that, this is a whole workaround thing, but I was supposed to be writing a whole nother book, and I started writing, this book is the full spectrum procrastinating on the first book, so the next book I have coming out is Finally Feeling Seen, <laughs> and it's about the intersection of neurodiversity and Blackness. Um, that should be out by the end of this year. Um, I also have, oh, but no, go By the full spectrum, because that's going to let me know, should I keep doing this author and thing? I'm going to keep doing it regardless, but please support the full spectrum. That's on Amazon. That's on Kindle. That's on Barnes and Noble. Um, and the audio book should be out by the end of this month. Oh, Yes. well, that's And a game I found, changer. I found it. I found a black woman with ADHD to read the book. I'm so happy. Oh, wow. I'm so happy about that. So, yeah. That's, that's where you can find me. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate you. This is so, I enjoy myself so much. Yes, for sure. We'll, we'll probably have to do this again. I mean, this is, there's so much more I would like to ask you, but I, yeah, we, we can do this again. I'll make sure I'll stay in touch with you as well. Okay. So you heard it here, everyone. Make sure you stay in touch with Teresa. And uh, also, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Share this with a friend because you don't know what someone can be dealing with. This very episode can help someone. Uh, if you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts by doing so. It, leave, it puts you on a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff? This is Sean Heineman with special guest Thressa. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. We are out.